we're going to loop in three additional speakers as well. So we have Max Maservi, who is Senior Sustainable Investment Consultant in Mercer U.S.'s Sustainable Investments team. Max provides advice on sustainable investment strategies, climate change, and impact investment approaches throughout investment processes. We also have with us Inga West, who is Senior Sustainable Investment Specialist in Mercer's European Investment Solutions business. She's based in London and is responsible for advising and driving the implementation of sustainable investment practices across the Mercer Investment Solutions offerings with a focus on integrating ESG factors, sustainability trends, climate change, and stewardship within the investment process. We're also thrilled to have with us McKnight Foundation's Director of Investments, Elizabeth McGovern who oversees the team that manages the foundation's $3 billion endowment. With her leadership and vision, the foundation committed to achieving net zero green gas, greenhouse gas emissions across its entire portfolio by 2050, the largest private U.S. foundation to do so. So we really have a powerhouse team here to understand how asset owners play a key role in helping clients prepare for their future. And generally how to think about client futures and ensure that sustainability is really where investment is headed. So thank you all for being here. I'm excited about this discussion we're about to have. And I'll start with you, Elizabeth. You're, this is fascinating what you've done under your leadership at McKnight and the lofty goals that you've set. Why is this so important to you? Why is leading on this commitment so critical to McKnight more broadly? Um, it's critical to McKnight because we are a climate change grant maker. So we um, recently kind of um, hearkening back to the urgency that Klaus talked about, um, we doubled our grant making to the climate change space um, several years ago. So we now provide $30 million to the nonprofit organizations, the policy actors, the advocates, the disruptors to do the work in the Midwest of the U.S. And if the Midwest um, Midwest region of the U.S. was a country of its own, our region would be the sixth largest greenhouse gas emitter in the world. That's how much industrial uh, and coal burning energy production happens in this region of the U.S. So once we'd made that commitment and included the words that we needed, that it was urgent and we needed to be bold. And frankly, we only give away 5% of our endowment every year, and the remaining 95% of the endowment remains invested in capital markets. So it became really clear that we were being beat on climate before we even arrived at the office in the morning. And that meant we needed to be bolder and more urgent with our endowment and try to find ways to invest differently so that we could contribute to, um, you know, both benefit from all of the wonderful innovation that's coming from the transition to a clean economy, but also make sure that we were reducing our risks um, to the older older economy and kind of uh, old ways of doing things. So we see it as an opportunity to make money, we see it as an opportunity to, to reduce risk, and we see it as a way to be kind of coherently aligned between the work that my colleagues are doing in the world and the work the investment team is doing in the markets. This really is a win-win-win, and you're making that very clear. So to those who are tuning in that are thinking about investments of themselves as individuals, of the broader organizations that they engage with or affiliate with, this is how to think about it. Setting these lofty standards is what we should all be aspiring to achieve. So thank you for sharing that, Elizabeth. Let's go to Max. Max, we're talking really about how to help guide clients to set their priorities and really help prepare them for a future that is aligned to this broader sustainability mission. How do you think about this? How does Mercer help clients do this? Sure, and thanks. So, uh, I, so our, our sustainable investment practice at Mercer started back in 2004 on a formal basis. And so we've been working on these issues for nearly 20 years now. Uh, we have 25 dedicated specialists around the world, and we've been advising clients on socially responsible and uh, sustainable investment topics for decades, even prior to the founding of our team. So across you know, investor movements on hot button topics, such as divesting from businesses operating in apartheid era South Africa in the 1980s, or tobacco manufacturers in the 1990s to, of course, climate change today. Uh, you know, we've been helping our clients to address key emerging risks and opportunities in their portfolios for many years. 
So over the course of you know hundreds, if not thousands of engagements with clients around the world, our uh, SI team or sustainable investments team has developed a four-step process that we call the SI pathway to help our clients clarify their perspectives and develop strategic approaches to considering key issues within their investment portfolios. So these four steps are beliefs, policy, process, and portfolio. Uh, there's tons of details we could discuss about each of those steps, um, but I think it's really worth focusing here on just the first two, the beliefs and the policy. And so when we're talking to our investors, we, we start our engagements by first, you know, providing educational sessions to our clients around, you know, what does sustainable investing mean? You know, what's the terminology that we're talking about? What are all the various acronyms that you want to be aware of and concepts? Um, and they're able to then ask us you know, any clarifying questions that they might have. We then survey each of these individuals on this you know, investment committee or board of trustees to understand their perspectives that they come to the table with. You know, do they believe in you know, these topics? Do they, what's their level of understanding of, of the various concepts at play? Um, and then you know, bring those survey results back and kind of have a workshop session to discuss the results uh, amongst the group and then find areas of, of you know, convergence or consensus and areas of divergence potentially. Um, from there, we want to kind of create these belief statements. And these statements are really, you know, an interesting sort of statement about what does this institution believe the future holds? And what do they believe that their role is in the world as an institution? It's a moment of, of almost self-reflection, if you will. And, you know, it may be surprising to some in the audience that, you know, major investors might start their sustainability journeys by thinking about what do they believe in about the world? Um, but what we're really ultimately asking them is, you know, what does the future look like? And what's the role that they play in helping to both you know, shape that future to potentially say impact investing as Mal was referencing earlier, or potentially just to mitigate some of those risks that they might see out on the horizon, whether it's climate change or other ones. So for everyone listening in today, and if you have investments of your own, whether for your retirement plan, you have a brokerage account or otherwise, uh, you too can start to ask yourself, you know, what sort of investor you'd like to be and what are your beliefs about the world? You know, thinking through your own beliefs and then finding ways to incorporate them into your investments is really at the heart of what being an intentional investor is all about. That's fantastic, Max. That really relates what it might be a black box for many people back to their daily lives. We're all wearing a variety of different hats. And the number one hat that we all share and have in common is we are humans and we have a belief system and we need to help some align that belief system better to the reality of the risks that we are collectively facing um, related to the changes in our environment. So thank you for sharing that and giving, giving our audience really tangible steps to take to think through their role in all of this. So I would love to turn now to Inga. We just heard from Max and Elizabeth how priorities are aligned to sustainability goals and how we see the future for ourselves, for the different organizations we affiliate with. And as employees of an organization like Mercer, how to help your clients better align their priorities to future sustainability goals. So how do you think about these priorities um, as part of a bigger picture, both company-wide and industry-wide? Sure, thank you. So as an investment manager with approximately $440 billion in assets under management globally, we at Mercer Investment Solutions believe we have an important role to play in the transition mm -hmm. and mobilizing capital towards more sustainable investments. Now, Mercer Investment Solutions uses an outsourced CIO approach. So we support institutional investors in an effort to meet their goals more efficiently by providing them with guidance on setting investment strategy, manager research and allocation, and the day-to-day -day operations of the investment program. Now, importantly, as a fund of funds manager, we have exposure to over 150 managers. And this affords us the opportunity to not only drive change within the investment solutions we manage, but also positively influence the investment managers we work with to invest with intent. This is so there's not only an impact through the portfolios they manage on our behalf, but rather on the market as a whole. Now, climate change is a systemic and financial risk, and it's one of our key investment beliefs. And therefore, climate considerations are embedded throughout our investment process. We have also set a net zero commitment um, with interim targets across a number of our investment solutions in order to support the transition. Now, setting a net zero commitment is just the first step in the journey, and it requires a well-articulated plan if we are to achieve it. 
And there are four key levers that we use as part of our approach. So firstly, focusing on ESG integration. We look to allocate to managers that have embedded consideration of environmental, social, and governance factors into the investment process. Our dedicated manager research team has assigned over 4,500 ESG ratings to investment strategies, and we use these to inform our manager selection decisions. Secondly, as part of ESG integration, there is a specific focus on climate. We use tools such as climate scenario modeling to inform our asset class allocations, given different asset class sensitivities to climate change. We also use tools such as our proprietary analytics for climate transition, aptly named as ACT, which uses a variety of climate related metrics to assess climate related risks and opportunities. They say what gets measured gets managed. And these tools provide us with the opportunity to monitor and manage our exposure to grey assets, so assets with high carbon intensity and low transition capacity, and green assets, so assets with low carbon intensity and high transition capacity. And thirdly, as much as the climate crisis poses significant risks, we know that there are numerous investment opportunities on the transition journey and we seek to include allocations to sustainability themed investments and investments that will drive the transition. And finally, as Nal alluded to earlier as well, we use our rights and responsibilities as active owners to influence the managers we invest in, to invest with intent and to work with the underlying companies they invest in to implement more sustainable business practices. And, you know, just to bring it to light slightly, this is done, for example, by encouraging these managers to develop and implement formal climate policies, support industry initiatives such as the Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosure and the more recent Task Force for Nature Related Financial Disclosures. We encourage them to enhance their climate related disclosures, set decarbonisation targets and actively engage with underlying companies and be active in their voting activities. And we work with them to enhance the consideration of climate factors across their investment process. Thank you, Inga. So from Mercer's ESG journey, I'm curious to get a different perspective on efforts in communication and ESG. So I'll come back to you, Klaus. It's no secret that Bayer has had its challenges and in terms of public perceptions and has really made an effort to build back trust with consumers and various stakeholders. So how has ESG supported this effort at rebuilding trust? I think two, two parts of the answer. The first thing, what I found very challenging in the beginning when designing a sustainability strategy was to understand that in different geographies in the world, the understanding of what sustainability actually means is very different. So in Europe, we have a very strong environmental focus on the topic. In, in the Americas, it's a much stronger uh, economic perspective on the same topic. Uh, and then in Asia, you would have much more the social dimension of sustainability. And you know, we need to come up with a triangle which is encompassing all those dimensions to get the acceptance around the world for what we do, but also to do the right things which are needed in the respective geographies. So. It's, it's really addressing the environmental pieces and the profitability pieces and the social dimensions at the same time, while we understand that not everything resonates uh, equally strongly uh, in every geography. That was important when it came to then translating a sustainability strategy into ESG, into an investable framework. I realized that the biggest doubts on us is on trust and transparency. So this is, I think, the area. It's it's not actually like change all your products, change all your uh, all your offers that you have, because it's I think widely accepted that you know we we make a significant and even systemic contribution, for example, to food supply. But the way we are doing it and the way we talk about it, this is challenged by 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 many investors and by many stakeholders. Um, and I think it's it's an opportunity for us. But this is what we need to learn. We need to learn to acknowledge <laughs> that we need to change and also that we made mistakes in the past. And I think we are on a good track. Um, and it's even rewarding uh, if you speak in, a, in an audience with lots of critical voices that you really connect. But we need to start our communication at the concerns 
of the audience and not at our perspectives for the future. And I think then we can make a successful connection. That's my learnings from the last couple of months. Yes, fantastic. Well, thank you for your candid response to that question. I'm sure it comes up and that's why it's so important to have these cross-sector conversations as well and to join forces with different types of organizations like foundations. And so back to you, Elizabeth, and the role that foundations can really play in um, in aligning to the broader mission across the sector, across sector of philanthropy, but also generally, how do you think about the bigger mission uh, of for grant makers? And how do how do net zero goals really align to that larger grant making mission? Well, I think the basis of philanthropy is belief in a better, different future. And sometimes it means that we know there are so many important social actors that need funding to do that work. Um, but it is there is a piece of kind of more traditional approach uh, to endowments and foundations to those assets that were built upon. There's a notion that there's a wall between us and the mission of the organization. And McKnight is really seeking kind of to, to integrate our views on the future and climate with our investment endowment. And um, I think one of the challenges in markets is um, sometimes people, uh, there's an assumption that markets are kind of a, without morality. They're just reacting to what is. And I think that's a huge mistake that asset owners really have a enormously important role in shaping future markets. And in order to shape markets, you have to send signals. And so one of the reasons McKnight made a net zero commitment was kind of hoping to invite some of our fellow foundations in the US into this conversation about how do we use our endowments to signal these important marketplaces. And it's been mentioned by colleagues um, in this session already, but the power of uh, the customer, even an individual customer, or in this case, we're um, a $3 billion owner, our fund managers can manage you know, up to a trillion dollars so it's important for them to hear from us. So we're asking for greenhouse gas um, emissions data on each of the funds in which we're invested. We're asking for how much, uh, how many of the investments in the portfolio are actually providing climate solutions. That kind of inquiry to your service providers is actually very motivating to them because they know if this small foundation in the upper Midwest is asking me today, I can bet that these other much bigger, more important clients of mine are gonna ask maybe next year or the year after. So I do think that, um, that there's kind of a, 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 a drive to integrate internally within our own walls, and then there's a desire to signal externally so that other financial actors can start getting the pieces in place. As you hear from Mercer that they've already done that, they've heard from clients and continue to develop services because they've been signaled by their customers. So I think each of us has a role to play, whether we're one investor in a personal savings or a large institutional investor. Absolutely. And you're paying attention to these signals. You're responding to the signals. And that's that's very clear here. Just this conversation is making it evident that you're paying attention and re responding and reacting to the needs and wants of your clients and consumers. So one of the things that is being expressed globally is a, a desire to see increased partnership and collaboration. And it sounds like that's happening within philanthropy from what you've just explained to us, Elizabeth. I'm curious as to how this hap is happening in the asset owner sectors. So Max, to you, how do you think about collaboration industry-wide? How do you think about data sharing? Is this something that could be pursued uh, maybe better or how is it going from your vantage point? Sure, it's a great question. So, I, you know, there's many ways to think about uh, how data sharing will work. And I think that, that it's important to step back and trace out a number of different regulatory and non-regulatory initiatives that are underway currently that you know, I fully believe are gonna radically reshape the amount of climate and sustainability data that investors and by the way, the general public are gonna have access to in the very near future. Um, so I believe Inga is gonna probably touch on some of the trends happening in Europe that they're already well underway uh, in, in, in her segment. Um, I want to at least highlight a few examples both internationally and here in the United States. Um, and I have to apologize in advance for the gratuitous use of a few acronyms um, here. We love our acronyms in sustainable finance. Um, but you know, the first one I would highlight is the International Sustainability Standards Board, or ISSB, um, which was an initiative that uh, 
set out in uh, it was launched in Glasgow, uh, the COP twenty twenty six in Glasgow last uh, November, um, and it's really this massive international consortium of different organizations that have, themselves have uh, put forth kind of disclosures. Uh, standards for different corporate, you know, disclosures and also investor disclosures. Um, they've come together to form this, this, you know, kind of climate and sustainability uh, framework that's intended to be adopted by financial regulators around the world. So they have an open comment period right now. They're seeking feedback from the public uh, about the kind of initial kind of drafts that they put together. But really what they're seeking to do is create an international framework for how we can capture gather and then you know disclose sustainability data uh, from across you know again corporate and investor spheres in a way that's really uh you know kind of unified and harmonized uh for the benefit of hopefully you know really all of us um so the issb is one that's a really major undertaking um here in the united states we have had more uh significant action from some of our regulators um, across various different spheres one of which the uh, Securities and Exchange Commission, our financial regulator, uh, just recently released climate disclosure rules for companies um, and, and also some private market companies as well. And so this is going to really require, you know, that every company, you know, virtually every company is going to be required to report, you know, scope one, scope two emissions, potentially uh, scope three and you know, I'm sure we can talk about what those scopes are, um, but really it's it's going to radically reshape how much information we have about where greenhouse gases are tracking across the entire you know economy. Um, and just because of the size of the U.S. marketplace, I mean, this is going to really, uh, you know, affect a lot of different entities, even those who have, you know, multinational operations. Mm -hmm. um, I would also mention that, that you know, Inga and, and others have touched on the TCFD or the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures, you know, this these recommendations were released in 2017 and they were initially you know they've been voluntary um in many ways it's kind of a cross-sectoral framework for disclosure of how companies and investors are considering and strategically reacting to climate related uh risks and opportunities uh to their business models um but what's particularly notable about tcfd is that it included this element of forward-looking what's called scenario analysis which is essentially projecting out into future climate scenarios of, of warming over pre-industrial times so you might think of one and a half degrees celsius as kind of the, the goal that we're all aiming towards these days but what if we overshoot that target what does a two degree celsius world look like and how would that impact your business what would a three degree celsius you know look like uh scenario look like and how might that affect your business model as well so it, it asks companies and investors really look out ahead and strategically plan for what eventualities could could occur the reason i bring up pcfd is because just recently we've had a development here in the united states also uh, where our, our national association of insurance commissioners who uh, regulate insurance companies here are now requiring that you know virtually every you know most i think 80 plus percent of insurance companies are going to be required to report against tcfd standards now, insurance companies, you know, as many of you know, they're they're kind of the, the risk managers of society, um, and the fact that they are now going to be, you know, looking ahead, incorporating more forward-looking scenario analysis um, into their assessments of risk, is really going to be quite significant. Um, so, all of this to say, all these interlocking elements are pointing towards the direction that we're going to be seeing a flood of new climate sustainability data uh, in the near future. I think it's going to be the job of many different global actors from across, you know, the business, governmental, and indeed the non-governmental sectors to kind of take in all this information and really assess whether our economy is decarbonizing uh, at the pace we need to reach that one and a half degree goal. This is fascinating, Max. Thank you so much for sharing this information. This really might, our viewers, some of them might be hearing this for the first time. So we appreciate the acronyms and the spelling out of the acronyms and the detail you're providing. It's very relevant. And you teed up a question for Inga. And so I'd love for her to respond to that, but, and to also to continue to make this relevant for our viewers, what is it that the single investor who's hoping to make an impact with their financial decisions and allocations, what is that you tell them? What should they be thinking about? So two in one for you there, Inga. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, very interesting what Max spoke to about TCFD initially starting out as a voluntary framework back in 2017. And similarly, in, in the UK, we've more recently seen that it has now also become mandatory for certain um, schemes mm -hmm. over a certain size, the initial one is 5 billion, to report in line with TCFD recommendations. And the view is that going forward, this will be rolled out to, to smaller schemes, um, possibly to the point where we are actually seeing all schemes having to report 
in line with TCFD. And I think also, you know, what some of the viewers may be familiar with is that we have seen a lot of regulation come out um, in the EU specifically as well as part of the EU Sustainable Finance um, Action Plan, really established to help mobilize capital to more sustainable investments. And as part of that, you know, some of the issues are around what is a sustainable investment. So again, the regulation coming out with clear guidelines as to what constitutes a sustainable investment, um, a lot of disclosure, um, you know, looking at the sustainable finance disclosure regulations, the EU taxonomy. So really trying to find ways to standardize how we look at things so that we can ensure that um, assets are going to more sustainable um, investments. And I think just on to the second point, I think Elizabeth kindly covered quite a bit of that, um, actually. Um, and I, I guess the point is that irrespective of how big or small you are as an asset owner, your voice counts. And it is, you know, largely because um, we have clients that are asking questions also, you know, triggering us to think of things differently. Um, so we really do value um, the input that we, we receive from clients. And I think very importantly, as a client looking for, you know, where do I want to invest, really to try and understand um, your manager's approach to thinking about sustainability. Is it really embedded in their the DNA? Um, are they purely setting out policies or are they able to actually evidence the, the impact and the outcomes um, that they, they are having and are they able to show that effective stewardship that they are having with the companies that they are investing in by engaging and what is the outcomes of those engagements been and are they linking their voting activities you know to these engagements as well so you know just as my my closing point i would say you know investors as investors we have a very important role to play in mobilizing capital to more sustainable investments and um while we have seen a significant amount of assets already start to move into sustainable investments much more is needed um, in order to move the dial and they say that um, with great power comes great responsibility and I really think that we as investors need to be thinking and embracing um, the growing opportunities that we have to, to invest with intent. Inga, so perfectly put. I wish <laughs> I could have handed it off to you and hit a gong because that was, that was an excellent closing. But before we close, I would love to just bring Klaus in for the final word and to really talk a little bit about how you think about how you measure success. How does Bayer measure success? And how does your company's story, how is it an example for others in your sector? And just, I know we, we only have a minute left um, and I wish I had more time to pick your brain. I had a previous life in pharma and biotech. So I have many more questions for you that I hope we can pick up in the future. But for now, talk to us a little bit about how you measure success. Yeah, let's not do a benchmarking. I just want to talk about how we measure success. For me, it's three things. The first is we keep going, running with high speed, embedding this in business. And just as a very recent example is in the crop science division, the sustainability department was fused with the business strategy department. I think that's a strong signal that this is changing and is now in a different place where it has uh, more, much more drive and also impact. The second thing is that we, that we execute against what we committed. Um, for me, super important. And I just wanna say that we also wanna go more and more to really measure impact, less and less into input commitments, much more into outcome commitments. And that's complicated, but a commitment to, to measure environmental impact reduction, I think is one of the first true impact commitments which are out there in our industry. And last but not least, I have to I have to use this opportunity. Uh, forgive me, but you know, if you want to help me and inside of the company to drive changes, make investments into Bayer which are assigned to ESG related changes, and make it clear. This would help me tremendously uh, to to make it super clear that this matters from a financial perspective. Um, and that's basically my, my ask to you. If you have any questions how this could work, if you have any proposals, what you want us to do differently, please contact me. Uh, but then, I mean, linking this to concrete investment decisions that would help us in the industry a lot to make it super clear that that's the way to go. Thank you, Klaus. And that's a fair ask to all viewers. 
become asset owners yourself and get involved in the decision making and let's let's together really become the solution to the climate crisis thank you all for all that you do and everything you've shared and for really moving money towards a sustainable future sustainable finance is such a critical component of what we're trying to accomplish here and you are all very much engaged in the space in a way that gives me hope and a lot of positivity towards where the future of this sector is headed. So thank you very much for your time and for your input.